Okay, good morning. Right, some of you have been here uh, for a couple of minutes looking at this. Hopefully you've written it down. If you haven't already, uh, write it down as we go. So we're going to move from the Coulomb law, which is the force exerted on one point particle on another point particle. Um, we're going to move from this law to the electric field. Um, we're going to take the same journey that we did when we transformed Newton's uh, force law for gravity into the gravitational field. So this will be a nice little revision of uh, gravitational fields as well at the same time. So what I want you to think about is that rather than having two particles that are producing an equal force on each, which they are, um, let's just focus on one of the forces. So let's just think about the force on Q. So everything we're about to say is equally true of the other charge as well, but we're just going to think about this one. Um, so this breaks the symmetry in the formula a little bit because big Q simply then becomes the um, attracting or repelling um, source, uh, whereas Q is then the attracted or repelled object. And we start thinking about the force being due to Q and it's being experienced by little Q. So that's what I've done up here with this formula. I've just moved the, 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 the little Q down to the side and grouped this bit together as all of the non-little Q bit of the formula. So all of this lot is kind of the origin of the force. And then this little bit here, this is the particle that's experiencing the force. So just, it's a subtle rewriting of the formula, but it allows us to make this move here, which is to say that the force now is equal to the experiencing charge, Q, multiplied by the thing that is giving us the force in the first place, which we're going to refer to as the electric field strength. And at the moment, because we haven't spoken about the electric field, that name doesn't make a lot of sense to us, but it is in one sense the, the strength of the force that is being provided by the, the uh, big charge key. Another way to think of the electric field strength and a much purer way of thinking about it is if we set Q to equal one coulomb, then we just get F equals E. And so uh, a purer way of thinking about what's the electric field strength is that it is the force per unit charge. And if you're ever asked what the definition of is of electric field strength, that's what you would go for, the force per unit charge. E happens to be equal to this for a point source. So when Q is a, um, a localized point source of charge, then this would be the algebraic expression for E. However, um, for more complicated arrangements of multiple charges, this formula would change its form to take account of, of an arrangement of, of lots and lots of different charges all in different places. And so E will only be equal to this algebraically for a point source. And in a second, we're going to generalize up to spheres of charge and surfaces of charge. And this formula wouldn't apply in that situation. Not necessarily. We'll come back to that. Um, before we move on to the electric field, though, I just want to draw your attention to the analogy with what we did for gravity. So you might remember that when we were doing gravitational fields, we had a formula just like this one. It was G M M over R squared. And we scooped one of the M's up with the G and the R squared. And we produced the little G, the gravitational field strength. And then we multiplied by the other mass. So this is the formula that we've got for the gravitational force. And if you compare it to the formula for the electric force, you can see the similarity now. So electric field strength, gravitational field strength, electric charge, and I guess it's, it's correct to refer to the mass as the gravitational charge. Charge sometimes being called um, a coupling constant. It couples 
the charge or the mass to the field and allows it to experience the field. So the electric charge and the gravitational mass um, are analogous to each other and the electric field and the gravitational field. It is a historical irritation um, that we have to use a different case for E and G, which sometimes confuses people and makes them think that, that they're different things. We can't use a lowercase e for the electric field because we're already using the lowercase e for the elementary charge, 4.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. And we can't use capital G for the gravitational field because we're already using that for the universal constant of gravitation. So it's just a little irritating that we've got a lowercase g and an uppercase e, but try to remember that they're the analog, analog, analogous quantity of each other for the other force. Okay, I'm just gonna go and switch to the computer and share my screen because I wanna do some simulations with you of the electric field. Um, but while uh, I'm just setting that up, you just uh, finish copying that down if you need to, please. Okay, so let's have a little look at this simulation. I'm going to walk you through uh, three different simulations this morning, and all of them are available on Google Classroom, and I would encourage you to have uh, a good play with them yourself, um, because it's uh, much more educational to uh, move things around yourself and see what happens rather than just watch me do it. However, just watch me do it at the moment. Okay, here is an isolated point charge um, in space, and that point charge is... Um, kind of exerting an influence over the space around it. And if we were to take a test charge, which by convention is always positive, so this is a tiny little test charge, which has practically, um, sorry, it, it has a one coulomb of positive charge, but we're going to ignore its own electric field. We're only looking at uh, the electric field due to the positive charge, which is why I'm using this little yellow dot instead of just plonking another positive charge on there, because if I put an actual positive charge on there, it would add its own electric field. So this is a hypothetical uh, one coulomb charge that somehow doesn't exert its own, its own electric field. Okay, so um, there is the force that it would experience, and the force is radially away from the positive charge because, like I said, by definition, the test charge is always positive, so the force arrow will always point away from um, a positive charge. And if I bring it nearer, the force gets bigger, and if I take it away, the force gets smaller. And what I could do if I wanted to was uh, populate this space by lots and lots and lots of these test charges, and if I do that, you kind of start to get a feel for the what we would call the vector field around the charge. And we've done this before when we did the gravitational field, and we spoke about the vector field as being kind of like a real field of crops, where these are the stalks of the plants sticking up out the ground, and they point in the direction that uh, the force is acting in. So this is quite a nice diagram at the moment, but we, we mentioned when we did gravitational field that it breaks down pretty quick. So for instance, if I put another charge too near, another test charge too near to that one, the force arrows overlap, which becomes confusing. Also, if I put the force, uh, the test charge too far away, the arrow is so small that I can't see it. And if I put the test charge too close, the arrow is so long that I can't see it. Um, and if I fill this up with test charges, all I get is a forest of arrows anyway, and it just becomes meaningless eventually because the whole screen just fills up with red ink and uh, we can't tell anything for anything. So this uh, was an okay representation of the vector field when we were only dealing with one or two charges at an appropriate distance, but it's not a great uh, representation uh, for the entire space around the charge. Um, so we also want to get in the inverse squared law uh, uh, aspect to it. So this charge here is a certain distance away. If I go roughly twice that distance away, it's not very clear from the diagram that this arrow is around about a quarter of the length of this arrow. And so it's not 
showing us intuitively this inverse squared law relationship. So what we're going to do instead of this simulation is we're going to switch to the one we use for gravitational fields, which is this kind of simulation instead. So we now draw continuous lines to represent the direction of the force, but now the, the closeness of the lines, the density of the lines, represents the size of the force. And here you can see that the lines are very close together, and so the force will be very high. And here the lines are much further apart, and the, the force will be smaller. Um, and if we talk about the density of lines passing through a spherical shell in three dimensions, around the point charge, then the surface area of a sphere is four pi r squared, and therefore the density of the lines is the number of lines, which doesn't change, divided by four pi r squared. So we've got that r squaredness in for the density of the lines. So this diagram has built into it an inverse square relationship, which um, properly represents the um, the electric field for a point charge. So this is slightly more complicated than we're going to want to draw on the paper. So we could consider a less charged charge. So this could be any value of coulombs. If we just bring the coulombs down so that it's not quite as strong a field, then the density of the lines reduces. Not entirely sure why St. Andrews has gone to the trouble of rotating the picture a little bit. I suspect it's for the next diagram that you're about to see. Um, but you can draw this more righted. Um, there are eight lines on this diagram. I, I would suggest that you copy this diagram into your book now, but just rotate it slightly so that one of your lines is vertical and the other one's horizontal, and then you draw the two 45-degree diagonals in like we did for the, for the gravitational field. And while you're drawing that, just one more time, um, the lines have an arrow on them to represent the direction that a positive one Coulomb charge would experience uh, a force in the direction of. And the density of the lines, the closeness of the lines, represents the size of the force. So where the lines are close together, that's a large force arrow. And where the lines are far apart, that's a small force arrow. OK, so we could also ask the question, um, what will happen if we show um, two charges next to each other? So let's have a little look at that. So. Here we've got the field lines um, largely the same uh, on the right and left of the diagram. And that's because these lines are primarily due to the charge that's nearest to us. But in between the two charges, uh, sorry, and the reason for that is it's an inverse square law. So the further we are away from the charges, the less the effect. Well, we're much further away from charge up the charge on the right and we are on the charge from the left. So the charge on the right has no influence over here or a little influence over here. Um, the interesting bits are all in the middle. So what we've got here is very widely spaced lines in the middle, which suggests a very small force and closer together lines here at the sides, which suggest a bigger force. Also, these lines are now pointing vertically upwards rather than being radially away from the charge. So what's going on here? Well, let's go back to our original representation of this. So I'll do that again. So over here, we can see that it's still radially away from the right-hand charge. And over here, radially away from the left-hand charge. Um, and that's because uh, it's the closest charge that is having the greatest influence. But in the middle, where the distances are similar, both charges will have an effect. And actually, right here in the very middle, you can see that this charge is pointing to the right, the force is pointing to the right, and this charge, the force is pointing to the left. And because it is exactly in the middle, and these two charges are exactly the same size, the force is cancelled out, and there's actually zero force in the middle. And even just near to this point in the middle, there's very, very, very little force. And that's why the arrows on the, uh, the lines on the other diagram are drawn far apart to represent uh, smaller forces. If I bring it up here, though, 
um, you can see that it is a, vo a vertical force. If I take this charge away, you can see there's a diagonal nuss to the right. And if I take this one away, a diagonal nuss to the left, but the effect is equal from both charges. And so the left and right components cancel out. Uh, but you can see the uh, vertical component gets longer because we're adding up the vertical component from both of these forces. And so we've got the upward force from this one and the upward force from this one, which is why the force is larger than we were going to have it, which is why on the other diagram, we have these lines closer together at the top. So I'm just going to give you a moment to copy this diagram down as well. Okay, so for a negative charge, we would now need to consider that some of these arrows are going to be pointing inwards. So if we just go back to this simulation. Okay, so um, there's a negative charge. We could use this representation instead, which we talked about a little bit when we did gravitational fields, with all the arrows um, just tethered at a point in space on like a grid-like grid -like arrangement. Um, and then we could color code it or grayscale it to represent the size of the field. And it works okay on the screen, but it doesn't work so well in your books. So um, yeah, we mentioned it when we did gravitational fields, but I forgot to mention it this morning. Okay, so there's a negative charge and here's the uh, test charge coming in and the arrows are pointing inwards because remember the test charge by convention is always a positive test charge. So it will be pulled in. Um, and if we have two, uh, uh, sorry, not two, uh, a positive and a negative, then we're being repelled largely from the positive one, we're being attracted largely to the negative one, but then this time in the middle, rather than cancel out, it doubles up. So we've got a push from the positive and a pull from the negative. So without the negative, there is a force arrow, but it's quite short. But with the negative, it's a much longer arrow. So we'd expect the lines to get closer together in the middle rather than further apart. And if we come up uh, to um, off the, the joining line, we can see that again, we've got uh, a right hand push from the positive charge and a right hand pull from the negative charge. Um, but what about the vertical components? Well, the positive's pushing it up a little bit, uh, but the negative is pulling it down a little bit and the two components cancel out to get horizontal forces here on this dividing line in the middle um, off, off axis. So let's just have a look at what the field would look like there. So here's negative charges. And again, we've got the field largely unaffected on the right and the left, uh, but we've got a closeness of the lines and a slightly denser arrangement of lines in the middle to show that there's two lots of forces here. The force has increased. Okay, so although I don't want you to draw the next couple of pictures, I'll just show you um, what happens when you have um, uneven charges. So um, you can see that if one charge is much more um, charged than the other one, then the electric field of the more positive charge, the more the larger charge is going to dominate. And you can see that the field for the large charge has only really been affected just here, right next to the, the smaller charge. Likewise, for negatives, uh, the the um, larger charge completely dominates, and you can see that the field from the positive charge has been massively deformed to put, uh, represent that right here, the force will still be away from the positive charge, but by the time you get up here, the negative charge is starting to pull the uh, test particle back again, and that's because despite the fact that it is closer to the positive charge, um, the negative charge has a greater number of coulombs, um, which is compensating for the inverse square um, reduction in the force. So we're not, we're not going to draw those two things, I just wanted you to see it. Okay, so we've just drawn the arrangement of charges for point charges, um, a positive, uh, a positive and a positive, a positive and a negative. Um, what about for more complicated arrangements of charges? So let's uh, switch to uh, this simulation instead. Um, so if you want to have a play with this simulation later, it does the same as the other one does. So you can still do two positive charges. Um, but what you can do with this one as well are arrangements of charges. So uh, let's just start with um, 
an arrangement, first of all, of just a whole load of positive charges that are all grouped together in a kind of spherical arrangement. Now, it's pretty hard for me to get a perfect sphere with this piece of software, um, but I'm doing my best. I think that might be as good as I'm gonna get it. It won't let me draw any other dots in. Okay, so it's not a perfect sphere, you can see that, um, but hopefully you can see that it's looking a lot like um, a radial field. I haven't quite got all the dots in exactly the right place, which is why the field lines are bunching together in certain places, like here, you can see that the lines are much closer together, but that's really just because I've kind of not quite got the charges perfectly spaced. Um, the point that I am trying to make is that for an extended object that is charged, um, if it's a spherical object with charge either on it or in it, then the field looks exactly like a point charge outside of the object. And these diagrams should look familiar to you because this is the same kind of diagrams that we were drawing for the gravitational field. So if you just uh, tap on the camera feed for a second so that you can see my whiteboard again, and I just want you to um, jot down the idea that for spherical distribution, distributions of charge, the field is exactly the same as for a point charge outside of the sphere. If it's a shell of positive charge, um, there is actually no force inside the, um, the sphere, so it is correct to draw the inside of the sphere as empty. If it's a shell of, of charge, if it's a solid lump of charge, there'll still be forces inside it, but if it's a shell, then yeah, technically no force inside the sphere. Okay, back to the simulation then. Um, so, what we can also do with the simulation is to think about a sheet of charge. Now, um, this is um, hasn't got any depth to it, the simulation, so you're just going to have to assume that there's a, a flat sheet of charge that's um, been laid horizontally uh, along here so that it's extending into the screen and out of the screen um, like a table. And the, the sheet of charge is positive, and you can see that if I were to put a test charge anywhere above it, it would get pushed vertically upwards. <clears throat> Again, what I can't really do so well on this simulation is have an infinite sheet of charge. Um, so we're just gonna have to um, pay attention to the middle bit of the simulation. You can see that this charge on the edge is managing to maintain its uh, sideways aspect to its force over here, but in the middle, you can see that a test particle here is being pushed to the right by all of these charges over here and to the left by all of these charges over here. So we do have this verticalness to the force in the middle. And for a true infinite sheet of charge, there would be vertical arrows across this, um, this screen rather than just here in the middle. So um, we could then ask, well, what will happen um, for the arrangement of Two, well, let's do a sheet of charge and one other charge. So here's a positive charge just above it. And you can see maybe as expected that the um, density of lines reduces here as all of these charges are pushing up, but this one is pushing down. However, it's not very successful because this is a very, very large number of charges compared to this one. And so this region is very, very small and these dominate. However, what would happen if we were to take a whole load of charges? So let me get rid of that one. Um, let's consider um, a positive plate of charge hovering above the other positive plate of charge. So you can see that between these plates, we have a zero field region. So if you wanted to completely get rid of the electric field due to some charged particles, you could take an infinite sheet of positive charge and place another infinite sheet of positive charge next to it. Obviously, 
you can't actually have an infinite sheet, but charges are very small. So even um, half a meter by half a meter is effectively infinite to an electron in the middle of those two plates. <coughs> so two positive plates next to each other, zero field in the middle. However, that's not the interesting arrangement. So, oops, didn't mean to clear the whole lot. Let me put those back on. The more interesting arrangement is not two positive plates next to each other, but two negative, uh, but uh, a positive plate next to a negative plate. So let me just switch to negative charges. So that's um, a negative plate up here and the positive plate down here. And you can see that in between, again, don't worry too much about the edge effects because technically we're talking about a very, very large sheet, which is much larger than this screen. So we just want to focus on the middle part of this simulation where we're not worried too much about the edges of the plate. And you can see that the lines are um, perpendicular to both plates, traveling vertically up the screen. Now, what this simulation also is doing is showing you positive charge gap, positive charge gap. And that's why these lines are not evenly spaced. Now, I'm going to add more charges, but I still can't get an infinite number of charges on the bottom. But hopefully, as, as I add more charges, um, you'll see the lines hopefully develop a kind of even spacing. It's just that we get hundreds of lines and it becomes very difficult to see um, exactly what's going on. But if I do it anyway, hopefully we'll get a kind of even grayscale effect as the lines reach an even separation. Is that enough? So there you go. Hopefully you can see that we've got a kind of even distribution of lines now. The density is pretty much the same. Don't worry about all the little green arrowheads. You're just looking at the vertical black lines. And what this is demonstrating to us is, apart from the edge effects where it bends ever so slightly up the sides, in the middle, between two parallel surfaces of charge, we have a field that is always pointing in the same direction. And no matter where we look in the field, the density of lines is the same. And if the density of lines is the same, that means that the force is the same. So it has the same direction and the same magnitude at every single point inside these plates. So right here next to this surface, right here next to this surface, over here in the middle, the force is identical, same magnitude, same direction, which basically means between these plates, the force is constant and the electric field is constant. And there is no distance relationship. That whole R squared bit, it's just gone. There is just no distance relationship with the field in the middle here. So I, I said that I wouldn't get bogged down with you with algebraic expressions for electric fields that weren't point charges because it gets very complicated. But this is going to be the exception next lesson. I am going to talk to you about the algebraic expression for the magnitude of the electric field between two parallel plates of charge uh, because um, it becomes so wonderfully simple, constant, in fact, with no distance relationship. So we're going to devote next lesson in its entirety to discussing the parallel plate arrangement of charge. But for now, while we're drawing fields, I'm just going to draw a picture of it uh, on the board uh, so that you can copy it down and have all of your field diagrams in the same place. So if you could just um, switch back to the camera feed.
So those are just three examples of how the field would behave near to a surface of charge, a flat plate of charge. So while you're drawing that, I'm sure you can listen, but um, you need to make sure that you draw the lines coming out of the surfaces at right angles. I haven't done a particularly good job on the sphere on the right hand side, try and do a better job than me. Um, but I'm rushing and I'm on a vertical surface. You've got your box, you should be able to do much better. And for the plates on the left hand side, um, just like in the simulation, you need to draw an even spacing of the lines. And again, if your plates are vertical, your lines must be horizontal and meet the surface at right angles and draw them with a ruler so that they are straight. So just to, uh, before we move on from the plates, just to, while the simulation's on the screen so that I don't have to do it next lesson, remember these arrows show the direction that a charged particle will be pushed in if it were dropped into that space. So uh, the arrows are pointing up the screen. That would be the direction that a positive charge would be pushed in. But uh, in, in materials, it's usually the negative charges that can move the electrons. So um, you could imagine that these two parallel plates of charge are actually the plates of a capacitor. And that this space in between is a dielectric, uh, which is full of atoms and including those atoms electrons. And so all of the electrons in the dielectric, they're all being pushed towards the positive plate in the opposite direction to these green arrows. Um, and so you can see that there is an even force um, across all of the electrons in the dielectric. And the goal is to produce the dielectric that can resist the, the force in that direction. Um, so one of the reasons we learn about parallel plates is because we've just learned about capacitors and this is practically one of those. Another reason is because it reveals the beauty of mathematics that we started off with a, a horrible um, inverse square law, law relationship which uh, algebraically is, is reasonably complicated to manipulate and yet when we take surfaces of charge all of those inverse square laws kind of add up to a beautiful constant number that doesn't have any r squareds in it at all so we should investigate that from a mathematical point of view just to see how that came to be we'll do that next lesson but also just while the simulations on the screen so that i don't have to make it again if i just make a little hole uh in the positive charges over here so just put a little gap here in the plate. Um, you can see that there is still a field here. It hasn't really disrupted the field very much. But if I were to drop an electron in this space, then it will hurtle across the gap, if this was a, truly a gap with no dielectric in it, and it'll accelerate as it goes across this plate, because remember the electric field is a force per unit charge and the electron has some charge, so there's a force on the electron. It's a negative charge, so it's in the opposite direction to these green arrows. And so as the electron gets accelerated across this gap, it gets faster and faster and faster and faster. Now, most of the electrons coming from over here, I do actually have a whole load of electrons at the top, so I can even use those as my source of electrons. As the electrons hurtle across the gap, they slam into this uh, plate over here most of the time, but at the gap, some of the electrons will sail straight through the hole. And so they'll come firing out of that hole like a little electron gun. In fact, it is an electron gun. And we're going to be talking about that next lesson as well. So um, that's the third reason why we like parallel plates of charge. If we make a small hole in the positive one, we've got ourselves an electron gun. Okay, more on the parallel plates next lesson. Let me switch to something else. Okay, so you might be thinking that I've just got some uh, simulation software that is just making it up. Uh, maybe it's all a lie. So uh, what I've got here is um, me doing a little experiment for you in class a couple of days ago. So um, what you've got here is a Petri dish that is um, 
full of oil, castor oil. And the only reason that the oil's there is I just need something gloopy that will allow some powder to lie on its surface. So I'm gonna sprinkle some uh, some pollen, actually. Oh, it's kind of a pollen, uh, a very small ground up seed that we're gonna um, pot on top of the oil. And it's so light that it, it's not gonna sink straight away. And the oil will allow it to move. So let me just stick it on double speed because it's easy to see what's happening. Um, so the there goes the powder. It's going to sit on the top. And now the the uh, the terminals are attached to a five thousand volt power supply, and so the middle is very very negative. The ring around the outside is very very positive, and you can see that the uh, little bits of dust are starting to um, line up in lines radially away from the center towards the ring at the edges. And that's because each one of those tiny, tiny little bits of organic powder, they're becoming charged little dipoles. Um, one bit is becoming um, positive and the other bit's becoming negative and then it's spinning around and attracting to the one next door and making little positive, negative, positive, negative cha chains. We can do the same thing here for um, a parallel plate arrangement. So one of the plates is at um, zero and the other one's at plus 5,000 volts. So there's a 5,000 volt difference. And again, we'll sprinkle some powder in between and turn on the power supply. And again, you can see the powder moving and it's stretching itself out into horizontal lines between the plates because those are the forces that are being applied to the bits of powder, dragging them left and right. They're clumping together into lines. I think I'm going to move the camera around to try and catch the lights. And what you want to look at um, when I do is that the powder hasn't really moved outside of the two plates which is the interesting thing. Uh, it's, it's stretched itself out into lines between the plates, but it hasn't really moved outside of the plates. We'll be coming back to what that means next lesson. Okay. That's what I wanted to say about electric fields today. Um, we've got about 10 minutes left, plus you're gonna have some study time that you're gonna wanna fill before our next lesson. So I just want to draw your attention to the textbook. Um, today we've been talking about 22.1 uh, electric fields. And we've talked about this uh, defining equation as the force per unit charge. And then we've drawn ourselves some diagrams like these ones, point charge sphere, um, the uh, parallel plate arrangement, two spheres, sphere and a plate. Um, what you're able to do now is have a go at these five questions here, mm -hmm. um, just to see if you've understood today's work. And then last lesson, we had a look at 22.2, but I told you, oh, <laughs> that's not very helpful, is it? Um, I told you that there was a question, I think it might've been question four or five, that you weren't able to do. Um, from 22.2 because we haven't done electric fields yet. Uh, so where's that gone down here it is. Yeah, number five here. So you weren't able to do that one last lesson so you could have a go at that one as well. And then if you really wanna look ahead at next lesson, uh, we've actually looked at 22.3 before. We looked at it when we were doing capacitance, um, but it does talk a little bit about the parallel plate arrangement for the electric charges and the electron gun. Uh, and this is basically what we're gonna be talking about next lesson, but you can peek ahead if you want to. Like I said, you've already read most of this 22.3 because we did it when we were doing capacitors. So you can just fill in the gaps if you want to. That's completely optional. What, what I'm really asking you to do is make sure you finish the questions on 22.1 and 22.2. And if there's anything that you read that you feel you need to add to your notes, please do that as well. 